Hi Miss Tews, what are we doing today? Today we are going to plan an extract for the GCSE Macbeth, which you have got next Friday. Fantastic. Okay boys, so we are doing extract roulette today. Miss Tews has not seen the extract that I have chosen and I'm going to pass it to her now. So without saying what it is, I want you to find it in your books and have it up as Miss Tews plans in 10 minutes or less. Oh, 10 minutes, okay. Very and exciting. I'm hoping you've been nice to me, Miss Murray. What is it? Oh, okay. All right, okay. It's Act 5, Scene 3. All right, okay, fine. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the question. And the question says, how is this a powerfully dramatic moment? So I'm going to just take um, those two key words. And I'm going to scan through the extract and I'm going to find the three ways in which this is powerfully dramatic. Well, the first thing I've got to say is that Macbeth is being really defiant in this extract. He says straight away from the beginning, bring me no more reports, let them fly all. Lots of imperatives there, lots of commands. So I think one of my things about it being powerfully dramatic, the pen that works, is going to be about Macbeth's defiance and how strong he is in the face of, well, impending doom. And we, the audience, obviously know that this is going to not go very well when Burnham Wood starts to move. Okay, we get an interaction with a servant as well. That could be probably quite good for this and how rude and nasty he is. Um, and we also get servants and soldiers and all sorts of things. Brilliant, okay. So I'm going to have one paragraph on that, and I'm going to have one on his realisation of the prophecy. And actually, I'm going to have one, I think, on his vulnerability, because underneath all of this, Macbeth does reveal a little bit about why he's quite concerned, even though he won't show it. Vulnerability. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> okay. All right. With those three things, and it's often a really good idea in the exam to try and make sure that your paragraphs are really different things. So rather than having Macbeth's defiance and then Macbeth's aggression or his confidence, those are quite similar. So I've made sure that my three paragraphs are very different things. So that's what my three paragraphs are going to be about. And now what I need to do is find quotations from the text that I can use to support those ideas. So if I'm looking for defiance, I'm going to look at the opening. So I can look at the bring me no more reports and let them fly all. Nightly use of imperatives there, which is really good because we can get some technical vocabulary in. He also says, I cannot taint with fear. I really like that. So let's have that one as well. And Miss Tees, what does that actually mean in case we are struggling with that in the next? He's saying that actually he cannot even show, he cannot even taint. Like if you tainted something, you kind of give it a bit of a facade, you, you change its meaning. He's saying he cannot even reveal his fear even slightly because he knows that yes, he's this horrible tyrant, but he knows at this point, if he's got to go into battle, he's got to go out fighting. He's got to be the warrior he was early on in Act 1, Scene 2, when we heard about him carving his passage on the battlefield, unseeming people from the nave to the chops. Brave Macbeth, as he was described earlier. So actually, that gives us a nice point to link to Act 1, Scene 2. And we can also look at the idea of fear. Remember how Lady Macbeth in Act 1, Scene 7 and Act 1, Scene 5 talked about him being a coward and putting his courage on the sticking place? This would be really useful for a little bit of comparison. So that's a great quotation that we can look at how defiant he is. He also has the repetition of let them fly as well. That is repeated. So it might suggest just how nervous he is about looking really defiant, really strong. Um, and we've actually just heard in Act 5, Scene 2, all the nobles calling him tyrant several times. So actually here, he's, well, he's conforming to what they expect him to be like. Okay. So we've got a few quotations here. You know what, that's probably all we need in a paragraph. By the time we've unpacked those in lots of detail, we've used some technical vocabulary, we've looked at this sort of abstract noun of fear, we've zoomed in on repetition, we've talked about the imperatives and the commanding language. That's gonna be enough for a paragraph. Let's move on to paragraph two, the prophecy. Um, we can look at Macbeth's use of questioning here. Look at how he notices, um, you know, what's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? And actually, Macbeth's questions, I'll put M's accused there, 
um, really tell us quite a lot as an audience that he's really starting to question the prophecy and he's trying to work out, have I been tricked? Have I been duped? Um, you know, he's saying it's, it's, it's impossible. The wood's got to move. The wood can't move. Um, so he's very firm on that. I think it was the third apparition that told him that the wood was, the wood was going to move. So he's, he's really firm that it can't happen. So we look at the prophecy um, and he even says to himself, fear not Macbeth, using the third person because he's a king. No man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. So he's really, he's declaring, he's using this declarative tone and he's explaining the, the prophecy to himself. It's almost like he's trying to tell himself that the prophecy is correct. Um, so we can zoom in on lots of those quotations from his opening um, little monologue there. We want to make sure, however, that we're talking about the whole extract. So if we sort of scan um, through the rest of the extract, um, we've got lots of lovely bits um, at the very, very end. Um, the Satan arrives and confirms that all of the army have now moved and they are within, I think he says they were within three miles of the castle. So actually the prophecy starts to become true over the course of this extract. That'd be a really good thing to do in the exam, to show the examiner that you've actually covered the whole extract. So we could look at the approach of the army And the drama that creates with the Satan at the very end saying, you know, all confirm my Lord, which was reported. So poor old Macbeth, over the course of the scene, it goes from bad to worse. A lovely bit of dramatic irony, so we can talk about that technique too. Excuse my handwriting. Okay. If we're looking at Macbeth's vulnerability, and we'll come back and flesh out this one a little bit as well in a bit. Um, we might want to look at Macbeth's reaction to the servant. Macbeth doesn't have a brilliant rapport with being very nice to his servants in this play, and in this one he's particularly awful. He even calls the servant a villain, which is a little bit of irony there, with an exclamation. We can't talk about punctuation in Shakespeare, but we can talk about the tone in which he's done it. So we can talk about this, you know, real kind of berating of the servant here. Um, and we might say it's perhaps a little bit ironic for him to be calling the servant a villain after all he's done in this play. Um, but look at what he says to the, to the boy. He calls him lily-livered. That means that, well, in the Renaissance period, they believed the liver was the seat of courage. So if you're saying to him, you're lily-livered, you've got absolutely no courage. But, of course, we know that underneath it all, it got a little mystery in this, does Underneath it all, it's actually Macbeth that's really struggling with his own courage in this scene. So we could, in this paragraph, really unpack the idea of courage and make an ugly link to Lady Macbeth or to him being a warrior in previous scenes and talk about how in this scene, when he's presented with a battle on coming, he panics and he feels particularly scared and he kind of, his outlet for that is to be really cross to whoever comes to the castle. He just, you know, fires back at them. He also talks um, about the cheeks being counsellors to fear and he asks him lots of questions. He said, death of thy soul, which of course we know Macbeth's soul is going, well, is dead, he's going to hell. Um, and at the very end, in Act 5, Scene 7, 8, and into Scene 9, there's lots of talk of souls and, and heaven and hell. So that might be an obvious thing to mention. Macbeth knows he is hell bound. But when the servant um, leaves to go and report back Macbeth's orders, um, we do get the vulnerability. He says he's sick at heart. And that's an emotion we can really look at. If we're talking about why this is powerfully dramatic. We might say that that is a really interesting thing from Macbeth. We haven't seen any vulnerability from him really since kind of Act Two, where he was debating about what he'd done, and um, then we have Banquo's death at the beginning of Act Three, and then it spirals, and then he's just really nasty from that point onwards. So here we get the idea that perhaps he's showing a little bit more vulnerability to the audience. That's really dramatic for us because now we're thinking: Do we sympathise with him? Maybe. So we can unpack that a lot. Um, we can also look at the idea, he says, that my way of life is fallen into the sear, yellow leaf and that which should accompany old age. This is a really strange, quite, it's quite a lyrical little bit of language from Macbeth there. It's a really strange thing for him to say. A battle's approaching and he's using this very descriptive language, this imagery of describing his life being a kind of a little yellow leaf that's fallen into the sea, into a kind of a gap, into a pit. So the imagery in that one, which we put imagery, a vulnerability, describing himself as this yellow leaf. And that 
adjective yellow leaf as well is quite interesting. You don't want to be a yellow leaf because that suggests you're a tree that's approaching autumn or on its way out. Um, so that certainly suggests to us that he knows his time is approaching. Uh, what else can we do here? Oh, there's a lovely asyndetic list. Brilliant. Okay, we've also got at the, um, the second monologue that Beth has in this extract, just before the Satan comes back in, um, we have a lovely um, asyndetic list as Macbeth mentions all the things that he's not going to be able to have because he's been so horrible. Really powerful for us, really powerfully dramatic because perhaps he's realising the consequences of what he's actually done. So if you look, he, he says all the things that he's not going to have are honour, love, obedience and troops of friends. That's quite a long quotation to put in, so if you were doing it in the exam, you could put the whole thing in, but then zoom in on maybe a couple of things from it. Honour is one we could definitely zoom in on. He's realising he's not going to have any honour. I mean, that's particularly powerful in a play that's all about kingship. Um, and actually, that it's coming from Macbeth himself? Well, that's the first time he's been particularly insightful in a while. Love? Well, we know that Lady Macbeth just died two scenes earlier. He's not going to find out for another two scenes, so that's quite... A little bit of dramatic irony again. Obedience. We've just found out that both sides of his um, armies have turned against him. So, yeah, that's gone. Um, and troops of friends. Well, he killed Banquo. He killed Macduff's whole family. Um, yeah, he is alone. So all of these things in this asyndetic list are particularly powerful because Shakespeare's heaping on the details. Honour, love, obedience, troops of friends. Um, I must not look to have. The modal verb must as well. He's saying I can't have that anymore. So there's loads of language stuff we can do for this. And notice how I'm using lots of technical vocabulary in my analysis. So there we go. We've got powerfully dramatic because of his defiance. We've got that it's again powerfully dramatic because of the prophecy that we see has started to not come true. And the vulnerability. Perhaps if I was going to reshuffle this, now that I've planned it, I might put that one first because that looks like it's going to be a really strong paragraph for me. And I might put that one second and that one third, because I like to put my first paragraph, my strongest one first, so that I know what I'm doing and I'm warming up. If we were to go back to the prophecy, there's some other lovely bits here um, that we could put in um, about, we could actually almost put some of these bits in here, that idea of honour and love and how it was him and Banquo knit together in this prophecy. And now he's very much alone because he's the only one that believed the witches. That might be something quite nice to pop into here too. Okay, that's my three paragraphs. Miss Murray, have I missed anything? Uh, I think that is amazing, Miss Tease. <laughs> She's biased. Uh, <laughs> and that is hitting 13 minutes, boys. Oh. So that is exactly how long you need to plan for. Remember that Miss Tease is actually talking through that as well. So it's slightly longer than if she was just in her exam writing it out. So you definitely have time for at least a 10 minute plan and then get on writing. So our challenge to you would be to, now that Miss Tease has planned that for you, get the extract in front of you and write it out in 30 minutes. See if you can cover those three chunky points with all of that analysis and that would be great. And if in the exam you, unlike me, you don't have a full whiteboard like this, this luxury in the exam room, what you can be doing instead is writing your three paragraph ideas at the top and then you can just label them on the extract to save yourself having to draw a big plan. If you want to draw a plan, that's you know absolutely fine. Um, but if you wanted to save time, you can also label the quotations, use some highlighters, on your extract, colour code it if you've got the time, and you can spend you know, a really good time planning for this. And um, there we go, all done. Don't forget an introduction and a conclusion. Maybe that'll be a future video. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Good luck, boys, for next Friday. Good luck. Bye.